So now we have uh, Patty Guvinen from University of uh, Minnesota. He will provide his comments on both of the papers and then discuss his related work on the same topic as well. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to especially thank Atif for uh, asking me originally to discuss uh, Ben's paper. And I think I appeared too eager that the next day he came back and he said, can you also uh, present some of your results, complementing what uh, Gabriel presented on wealth inequality. So this will be uh, like 15 minutes parts. The first part will be a presentation on uh, some of the work I have done and some of the work other people have done on trends in income inequality to complement trends in wealth inequality. And then I will turn to a discussion of, of uh, Ben's paper. There will be a lot of interaction between the two parts, as you will see. I will use some of the facts that I, I, I document in the first part to, to, to uh, discuss uh, Ben's paper with uh, Xavier and, and co-authors. So uh, there will be two subcomponents to my discussion of trends in income inequality. Uh, the first one is something that I think we have neglected for a long time in, in studies of inequality. And that is, what's the role of employers or firms in the rise of wage inequality? And today I'm going to talk about that. And hopefully I will try to convince you that we should think carefully about where you work when we think about uh, the rise in inequality. Second, I will turn to some uh, key trends on uh, top end inequality. There's a lot of work out there on this. The difference of what I'm going to talk about will be uh, micro data, okay? And I will talk about that in just a second. Uh, I just forgot to mention this. A lot of what I will say today uh, is based on joint work with several co-authors, Greg Kaplan at Princeton, Nick Bloom at uh, Stanford, Sardar Oskan at Toronto, Fatih Karahan at the New York Fed, David Price and Luigi Pistaferi at Stanford, and of course, Jay Song at the Social Security Administration, which is a lot of the data that, that I will be talking about today. So um, the data is uh, something that's really novel. I have been using it. Other people like Emmanuel Saez and others have used recently. Uh, it's what we call the Social Security Administration's master earnings file. And uh, it's kind of unprecedented in its level of detail. It's the population of everybody in the United States from 1978 to today. And uh, so it covers 35 years. It has information on salary and wage workers from W-2 forms. It has some key advantages. The first one is it's not a sample. It's the universe, OK? So you, know, you have a lot of data. It's a very large sample. But second, you have more. We actually have, for each job, we have unique employer IDs. And for each of those employers, we know the SIG code. We know the industry that it, it's located. So what we did, using this worker side information and where they work, we have created a matched employer employee data set for the United States. Okay, all the firms in the United States and all the employers. And that allows you to, to do some things that we couldn't previously do. Another advantage is there's no top coding. Okay, so we'll be able to look at really, really rich people, which normally you cannot do with other uh, uh, social security based data sets. So the first question. If we look at the total rise in wage inequality, how much of that happened within each firm and how much of that happened across firms, okay? Is it that different firms are now paying very different wages or is it that within each firm inequality has gone through the roof? Now, this is, this is from our work with Nick Bloom and, and uh, David Price and Jay Song. Uh, I will start with some graphs. We'll invest like a minute understanding it, but hopefully it will be worth it. Okay, so let me, let, let me start with this graph. And this is a usual way of looking at the data, uh, which is we, we look at the percentiles of the wage distribution in 1981. We look at every single percentile. And then here I look at the change in income at that percentile between 1982 and 2012. Over 30 years, for example, how much has the top 1% risen? How much has the 98th percentile risen and so on? And we get this very monotonic kind of rise. The implication is it's not that the wage inequality has risen in one part and not the other. 
it's that the entire distribution has been stretched out, okay? And uh, it, there's a little bit more happening here, but we'll talk about that in just a moment. But other than that, inequality has risen everywhere. Now the question is the following. Suppose I go to a particular percentile, workers in the 98th percentile. I find the employer of each one of these workers. I compute the average wage paid by that employer. And then I plot a similar graph, but now showing the dispersion of wages paid by different employers. How does that look like? It looks like this. Now what does this tell us? Well, the top paying employers today uh, are paying about 60%, these are log percent, 60% more than what they were paying in 1982. The lowest paying employers, they are paying almost the same. In other words, the rise in overall wage inequality between the top workers and the bottom workers is 60%. The rise between top paying firms and bottom paying firms is 60%. So all the rise that we see out there happened by different firms paying very different wages. Let's look at the flip side. I can also calculate that. Let me look within each employer. What happened to inequality? Well, it's this green line. It's almost nothing. Actually, there is some shrinking. Now, within each employer, people are making slightly more similar wages. Now this goes quite opposite, contrary to what we used to think. In particular, you know, there are quotes like this. So the primary reason for increased income inequality in recent decades is the rise of the super manager. Who says that? Well, Mr. Piketty, Piketty believes in that, okay? There's a very highly cited you know, uh, report by Michel and Sabadish. They say a key driver of wage inequality is the growth of chief executive officer earnings and compensation. So is that right? Let's see, let's see. I am not going to look at, chief executives are right here. I'm not going to take that percentile. I'm going to split it into 100 uh, groups further. And this is what you see, okay? Uh, ben said fractals, this is a fractal, okay? <laughs> so you go into the top 1%, you see exactly the same pattern. So this is the 99th percentile. This is the 99.99 percentile. Again, wage inequality rises the scale has changed. So the 99.99 percentile grew, this is logs, you have to exponentiate it, by about five-fold, whereas the 99th percentile rose only by 50%. So even there, there's a huge rise. But notice the following. This is the firm inequality of workers working there. Look at the CEOs, the very top earning people in the distribution, look at their firm, and look at this is now, this point is how much has the top earning workers in a firm increased their wages relative to the average wage at that firm? By about 10%, okay? So this idea that uh, the CEO compensation has grown so much, it's overwhelming all inequality is not true. We are focusing too much on the CEOs of very big firms. In the 99.99 percentile, there is about 15,000 people. But usually we think about like a handful, not handful, but a couple of hundred firms. And that's kind of distorting the, the, the picture that we get. So that's number one, that's one, one, one finding. Now I want to focus a bit more on the top earners. And I want to especially talk about what we call the glass ceiling. There's a lot of discussion going back maybe 30 years, maybe more, about the lack of representation of women at the very top. But unfortunately, we didn't until recently have data to study in a representative fashion how many women are there at the top. And one advantage of this data set, we can do that, okay? So a lot of previous work was based on aggregate data or they were based on CEOs, executives, you know, very selected groups of, of women. One graph I want to show you is the following. How many men are there per woman in a given top percentile over time? And this is the graph. In 1983, there were about 50 men for every woman within the top 0.1%. And today, it's about nine. Okay, so there's a rapid improvement. There's still a lot of room to grow, but there is a rapid improvement over this period. Let's look at the top 1%. 
not sub zero point, the ratio was 30, now it's about five. Now, of course, you have to also account for the fact that women's labor force participation is slightly lower than men. So I'm going to now do that. I'm going to flip this graph and correct for the fact that there are fewer women in the labor force. So I will ask the following question. Conditional on working, what is the probability that a woman will be in a top 0.1% relative to a man? And again, that used to be about 3%. Now today it's about 17%. But the improvement is very linear. So it seems like there's almost a, 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 a secular trend. That's not true for the top 0.1%. It seems like there's a slow, slowdown going on, okay? Now, another aspect that hasn't received attention uh, which we think is very important is the following, is what we call the paper floor. One reason women were not represented at the very top is that they used to fall through what we call a paper floor. What do I mean by this? Ask the following question. Conditional on being in the top 1% today, what are the chances that you will be in the top 1% tomorrow? Tomorrow meaning next year. In 1981, for men, that number was 55%. For women, it was only 25%. So when women went up to the top, they were coming down quickly. And the main difference is today, they have almost caught up to men, okay? Both men and women, they are more stably in the top, top percentile, but the gap has shrunk between men and, women, men and women, okay? That actually accounts for a lot of the rise that we see in women's representation at the top. Now third, I want to look at industry composition because as an economist, one of the reasons I care the most about top earners is because I want to understand uh, the talent allocation at the very top. Who are these people? What do they produce? And um, we look at all the different industries in, in the paper. Here I'm going to highlight the main two basically uh, leaders, if you will. Uh, finance and insurance in the top 0.1%, they, they were 17% of the top, uh, they went up to 31%, okay? Today, the largest part, as you can imagine, is finance and insurance. Health is a different story. Health workers, these are mostly doctors at the top. They used to be 25% of the top earners. Today, it's only 9%. So there was a large, basically, changing of, of leadership between, with, 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 with doctors kind of sinking and finance taking off. But when we talk about top, top earnings, uh, one thing I want to be very careful about is we have to be specific about what we mean by top. Do we mean top one, top 1%, 1 top 0 0.1, top 0, 0 0.1? Facts can look very different. Let me show you. Let's look at the same thing in the top 1% now, okay? Finance goes from 14 to 19. Health does fine. They go from 80 to 20. So you can read one report saying that, well, doctors dis are disappearing from top earners. That will be correct. That will be referring to this. Another will say doctors are doing just fine. That will also be correct. It depends on what part of the top we are looking at. I want to, sh okay. I, I want to show you one last uh, uh, figure about top earners, which is very much related to what Ben talked about. And personally, it's something that, that I find to be quite important. Um, and this is my contribution to the finance part of the, the, the conference, I am going to think about workers' wages as like the return on a stock. And as you know, in finance, you know, we run these cap and regressions, trying to relate the return of a stock to the market return. How much systematic risk there is in a stock, I'm going to do the same thing for wages. I'm going to say, let's take workers in sector J, let's look at their income change, regress it on GDP growth. The coefficient here, beta, is what we call a measure of systematic risk, okay? When GDP grows by 1%, how much does your wage grow? And I'm going to do it separately for bottom 99%. And I have, you know, these are sectors that are put together to resemble occupations. And we talk about how we do that in the paper. If you look at the bottom 99%, the coefficient is around one, slightly less than one. This is very reasonable, of course. If you aggregate, you have GDP here, you have the wage bill here. So they should go kind of one for one. What is interesting is, suppose I look at the top earners. Now the picture is very different, okay? If you're a top earner in manufacturing, durable manufacturing, your coefficient is almost 10. 
meaning that when GDP goes down by 2%, your income goes down by 20%, okay? If you look at engineers, software engineers, computer manufacturers, business consultants, they are all about 10. So this speaks for very large systematic wage risk that is experienced at the very top. And personally, I think if we want to understand why wages are growing so fast at the very top, I cannot think about that without thinking about the risk, the systematic risk that is uh, embedded in their wages. Now look at the following, look at health. Remember doctors I said were declining among top percentiles. Their wages are the least cyclical. They are very much immune from business cycles. So you might think about the compensating variation story where if you take a lot of systematic risk, your wages grow fast, okay? I will just skip, I'll basically let me uh, very quickly summarize. I will, uh, number one, almost all of the rise in wage inequality happens across firms. Within firm, almost nothing changes. That may also explain why a lot of people don't realize that inequality is rising. Because you look at your colleagues at your workplace, well, we were the same 30 years ago, we are still the same. But what is changing is differences across firms. The rise of top end inequality, I don't think is due to the rise of super managers. Instead, it's the rise of super firms that pay a lot of wages, okay? So in the interest of time, I will basically uh, get to discussion of uh, um, Ben's paper with, 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 with uh, other co-authors. Let me quickly give you an overview. Uh, I was actually very happy to be discussing this paper because I think it's a fascinating paper. It's very much related to a lot of the issues I have been thinking about uh, recently. And the basic story is, as Ben very nicely explained, it investigates a broad class of uh, models of inequality that goes back to 1953. Chaperon was, I think, one of the first people to propose it, um, which is based on proportional random growth. And what, what the paper does, it focuses differently than others on the dynamics, the evolution of inequality after a change, a shock, a structural change in the economy. And that's kind of new. That's quite new. They may, the, one of the main contributions for me is they have beautiful analytical work. They have nice derivations for the convergence time uh, after the change happens. And they do this both for the convergence of the overall distribution and very importantly, how quickly or how slowly the top end converges. Some of the numbers that they get from the baseline model are eye-opening, okay? It takes 80 years for the top end to converge in, in certain cases. And as Ben showed, that is much slower, uh, th than an order of magnitude slower than the rapid changes we seem to see in the US data. They consider two experiments. One is um, they, they take an increase in R minus G and say, can that be explaining this rapid rise in wealth inequality that, that Gabriel, uh, Emmanuel, and others have, have documented. The second experiment is they look at top end income inequality. They say, well, if the variance of income shocks increase, can that explain the rise in uh, income inequality? The answer to both is no. The baseline model cannot explain it. So what do you need, basically? You need to modify the basic model, and they modify it by uh, doing two ways, but one of which is dear to my heart because I have actually uh, uh, argued that we have a lot of evidence about it in microdata. It's that you, you, you not only have a random walk, but you also have individual specific growth rates. Different people's incomes grow at different rates, and you can motivate that by, by human capital theory and other ways. So let me, I will have three main comments. The first one is, um, the paper takes innovations, the shocks, to be Gaussian, to be normal. In the data, the shocks cannot be further from Gaussian. And I will show you that, and I will suggest some modeling options. The second one is in their experiment, he briefly alluded to, to, to uh, that. They take the variances of earnings shocks to be increasing over time. That is the conventional wisdom, but I'm going to argue that actually that's not true. Okay, and um, third, I'm going to say, I'm going to encourage them to study real dynamics, meaning track workers over time, top earners over time. There's a lot of information in that that can help us sort out these models. So how do, how, how do we model shocks? Let me go back to the basic model that, that um, Ben considered. We have a random walk, and there is a, a, a fixed drift term 
and there's an innovation that they take to be a normal uh, process. This is very standard in the literature, okay? What this paper adds is this term I. So basically it says not only there are shocks, but my income could be growing systematically faster than your income. And like I said, I have written a number of papers where I said it's in the data. It's important, we should model it. And uh, Ben and co-authors, they show that for, for uh, the, the transition of top end inequality turns out to be important. But you know, as a simple representation, that's useful. But if you think carefully about this, it implies that you know, uh, my income grows at 8%, your grows at 3%. It's a very gradual divergence of income over time. When we look at top earners, we seem to see huge sudden jumps in income, not like gradual every year, 2%, 5% there. So let me show you that. What I will do is I will actually focus on this term in the data. I have empirical measures of this, and let's see how it looks. So I'm going to show you the histogram, or the probability density, if you will, of uh, the data. Let me start with the model. This, the, in the data that we have, and others have uh, similar numbers, the standard deviation of income changes are about 50%. That's a huge number, all so gigantic that you might say that cannot be true. Your income on average changes by 50% every year. You know, it doesn't seem too reasonable every single year. And this is a normal distribution that we use to model. How does the data actually look like? This, okay? So it doesn't look anything like a normal. Actually, I can give you, in the interest of time, I will skip. You can calculate how much mass there is very close to zero in the data, how much mass the normal implies. The, 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 the data has three times more mass near very small changes, meaning that the standard deviation is 50%. Most years you will observe like 2% change, 5% change, okay? And the tails, let me give you some numbers. The probability of an extreme income shock meaning your income quadruples or your income goes down by 75%. In the data, it's 12 times larger than under a normal, 12 times larger. These are not details. These are enormously big numbers. So by the way, kurtosis, you know, it's a, something that five years ago I thought was the most obscure thing in the world, but actually I like to, you know, I, 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 I got to like it. And <laughs> it's one of the most common things that you see in sciences. And the history of Kurtos in economics goes to 1915, okay? The economists noticed that price changes are extremely leptocurtic. Cotton prices, wheat prices, forward, future prices, stock prices, and so on. In biology, for example, we find that the distance that species travel, they are extremely leptocurtic, and so on. So this is not something so obscure. Uh, let me give you like a quick back of the envelope calculation. How important can that be for risk? I will go back to 1965, Arrow and Pratt. They have this thought experiment where they said, well, let me confront a decision maker <coughs> with the following. Either you are going to hold a, a gamble that will push up or down your consumption by a fixed amount, by a random amount, or you can pay a premium to avoid the gamble altogether. And this is the framework we always use to measure, you know, how much people pay, are willing to pay to avoid risk. I'm going to consider two scenarios. Number one, suppose that this gamble is a normal with zero mean 10% standard deviation. The second gamble has the same mean, same standard deviation, but I'm going to say allow it to have a skewness coefficient of minus two, negatively skewed, and a kurtosis of 30. Why? This is what we measure for a 45-year-old male in the United States who makes $100,000. That's their income shock, okay? Now, if you look at the first gamble, that's a, that has a kurtosis of three, that's normal, skewness of zero, you will pay about 4.88% to avoid it. Risk aversion is 10 here, okay? How about the alternative gamble with the same mean, same standard deviation, you will pay 22%. So again, there is a five-fold almost increase coming from the fact that income shocks are leptocurtic, okay? So I think we should take this seriously, and I think it should be, you know, an, an, so if, you, if I was giving this talk like five years ago, I would say, yes, it's all in the growth rate. <coughs> but my recent work and some other stuff I've seen, I think, you know, the, the non-normality is very important. 
How do we model that? Very easy, okay? You can do a normal mixture, very tractable. We all know how to do that. There's a more sophisticated variant of that, which I want to bring up, because I don't think it's really used much in economics. It's called a subordinated stochastic process, okay? It sounds fancy. It's very simple, very tractable. The idea is very appealing. The idea is to distinguish between clock time and market time. What is the clock time? There is eight hours of trading today in the New York Stock Exchange. That's clock time. But market time means today there might be a lot of information that's happening in the world. So today there are more shocks that are actually coming in in a given clock time. So rather than having the, cl the, the, the calendar clock time and market time grow together at a constant rate, a subordinated process writes a stochastic process for time. Okay, or imagine all of us, right? In a given year, think about all the things that can happen. You wrote five new great papers, okay? There's a lot of information, okay? So then your wage can jump by a huge amount because the market time actually has moved a lot, okay? So in other words, you can take Ben's framework, you have a random walk, but you don't have a single innovation. You have the sum of n tilde innovations where n tilde is a positive random variable. So some years you get two innovations, some years you get five. You can gen actually, there's a paper by uh, Clark in Econometrica in 1973, shows you can generate any amount of kurtosis that you want. It has a number of other uh, uh, nice properties, very tractable as well. There's a large literature on this. There's of course the third option, which is the Mandelbrot's original idea. You can use double Pareto. I personally prefer one and two, but you know, the bottom line I think we should take kurtosis seriously. The last thing I want to conclude with is, this idea that income variance, income uh, shocks are getting bigger. And Moffitt and Gottschalk have documented this in a famous paper uh, in 1995. There's a lot of work, some of which Ben cited, that confirmed uh, the same finding. And uh, let me just quickly show you their graph. Look at just the green line. Let's ignore this for a moment. The variance, the total variance of income shocks rose from 0.15 to 0.40. So people have looked at in the past 20 years and they said, oh my God, this is you know, terrible. There's a lot more risk in the world, not to you know, implicate anybody, but take Lundqvist and Sargent, Econometrica paper, a Nobel Prize winner. They start their paper with the following quote. A growing body of evidence points to the fact that the world economy is more variable and less predictable today than it was 30 years ago. There is more variability and unpredictability in economic life. Who said this originally? Jim Hackman, another Nobel Prize winner, okay? Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with their conclusion at the date they made the conclusion based on the evidence that they had. But all of this work was actually coming from one data set, which is the panel study of income dynamics, every single one of them. The last few years, I and many other people actually, there, there's, there's contemporaneous work on this, uh, have looked at this again using administrative data. And this is what we find, okay? Just focus on the red line. This is another measure of dispersion. You could do standard deviation, exactly the same conclusion. This is the income volatility of individual income over time. Do you see anything going up? <laughs> nope, it's uh, trending down. We have looked at this within every industry. Look at services. It almost goes down by 50%, the volatility. Look at construction, down. Manufacturing, down. <laughs> Trade, down. There's not a single sector where it goes up. So I think we need to kind of revise our thoughts on this. Uh, one thing that I find very reassuring is that a lot of labor economists have always had to struggle with the Moffitt and Gottschalk conclusion. Like when I was talking to Rob Scheimer, who is a labor economist, Steve Davis, uh, John Haltiwanger, about three, four years ago, they were scratching their heads. They were saying, we look at the data, Labor churn is declining. What is labor churn? The employment to unemployment flows. That's declining for the past 40 years. Firm entry exit rates are all declining. Worker reallocation across firms are declining. So how is it possible that wage volatility is increasing against all this decline? And now I think, at least uh, I am convinced, it was a PSID phenomenon. 
PSID has measurement issues, and I think it's been getting worse over time. I'm happy to discuss uh, later this in more detail, but when you correct for it, you see basically no evidence of increasing volatility or uncertainty based on this data. Summary, it's a great paper, lots of food for thought. Uh, I'm always excited to discuss preliminary papers because you hope that you have a tiny chance of you know, influencing its direction. There's a lot of work that's remaining, but it's very exciting uh, what's left. Uh, like I said, I want to encourage you. I am not able to share today. We have data. We will actually publish this uh, relatively soon about the dynamics of these workers over the life cycle. And uh, there's a lot of information in that. I am not convinced really that the variance is going up. And, um, but I, I love the last model with H and G, with, it, with H and L. And that's, that's about it. That's all I have to say. <laughs>